So Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to hear more about the work that um, Mana Food Center is doing and just kind of your role in community food education, um, such an important role and something that is, um, you know, housing is important and that's that's what our, um, our members focus on is providing high quality affordable housing for older adults who, um, who need that. And um, I think food is, you know, just a central part of our lives. So really interested to have this conversation with you today. Um, and would love if you could introduce yourself to the group a bit and speak a bit more about Mana Food Center and what you all do. Sure. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Allison said, my name is Cynthia Wilson. Um, I am the Community Food Education Program Manager at Mana Food Center. Mana Food Center is the largest uh, food, assistance, food assistance organization in Montgomery County, Maryland. And we provide food assistance in many different ways. So we have multiple locations across the county that any participant can go pick up food at. Um, we have several different models. One would be, we have a choice model where like the location I'm at right now is in Silver Spring. And it looks like, we call it our market, but it looks like a grocery store. And it's called the choice model where people can go pick whatever th food they need for their own abilities, for their own diet, that type of thing. And then our other um, locations are more of a box style, which is usually what you'll traditionally see in food assistance. Um, we also have some um, home deliveries, particularly for seniors, or and our, really our home deliveries came from COVID. So it was anybody who might be have COVID or have come in contact with somebody who had COVID, seniors, any person who felt like they needed additional support specifically because they have children and maybe there was nobody else to watch them. So a home delivery would be beneficial. And we've kind of continued that um, into this kind of mid post COVID world. So that's really what our food assistance looks like. We also have SNAP that operates out of our office. Um, so we do both SNAP education and then we also have just our regular food assistance. So in my role, I primarily focus on cooking education, um, nutrition, health and wellness. I'm a licensed nutritionist in Maryland and I have a master's in nutrition and integrative health. And so we do presentations like the one I'm going to show you today is a prime example of a presentation we would give to a, a potentially a senior um, population or just adults that are interested in growing, a, uh, excuse me, growing, excuse me, aging gracefully, the G and the A were messing me up. Um, but so that's, this is kind of the presentations you would see. In addition to that, we do cooking classes and in our cooking classes, the way we were doing them, and I'm actually shifting them in the process of shifting them right now, but we would do home delivery of the ingredients for the classes. And then people could just jump on Zoom as we are doing right now and participate in the cooking class. We also have some small groups where we try to be more focused and build community and build relationships amongst the people who are in the class. And we really focus on, for example, I have a cohort that I call a uh, seed to table where we provide soil, we provide pots, we provide seeds. We'll, the goal is to take the intimidation out of growing food and then the intimidation of, okay, I just I grew this thing, what do I do with it now? And how do you implement and put those things into a recipe? So let's say we would grow three plants at the beginning and then mid to end class, we would do a cooking class that we would use all of those um, plants in a recipe. So really morphing with a lot of different things. I also do social media, um, just really trying to figure out and work on getting nutrition and health information out there because it is so important to, I'm sure as you guys know, um, to just the health of an individual, but it can make such a difference in food security, ensuring that, you know, it, of course it's important to eat, but also it, ideally if we can eat healthfully, then it supports our longevity of our life. So once again, I'm going to be doing a presentation, which would be a prime example of a presentation I would do in one of our wellness presentations. And this one is called Aging Gracefully. I'm almost positive. So give me one second. I'm going to share my screen. 
Oh, I also want to add, please feel free to unmute. Um, there are quite a few questions and I would love input if you guys don't mind. If not, I will just leave a really healthy pause for anybody to jump in and then I'll just move forward. Okay, um, so we're gonna get started. So let me move this stuff. So we are gonna go through a different, a few different areas in our discussion today. We're gonna first talk about just the aging process. It's one of those things, some people love it, some people hate it. Sometimes we just let it go. It's the unfortunate part of life, but you know there is a way to do it gracefully. We'll talk about life cycle nutrition. Excuse me, nutrients, and what are the nutrients that are really important for older adults. We'll also talk about other food considerations. You know, we'll talk about how as you get older, you lose some abilities, and how can we either compensate for that or ensure that we're. I won't. The best way for me to say it's like overriding that. So for example, a lot of older adults lose the ability to kind of identify thirst or identify hunger. So we'll talk a little bit about that in general, but also, okay, here might be some beneficial ways to make sure that we're still getting those nutrients so that we're still fulfilling what our body needs. We'll talk a little bit about movement and wellness just in general. Um, once again, all you know, how do we do this thing, this aging thing in the best way possible? Okay. So my first question, and once again, please feel free to unmute, is what is your level, excuse me, is your level of wellness different now than it was 10 years ago? And if it is, what has changed? Or if it isn't, I'm really curious as to how you have kept it the same. Okay, so I'll just use myself as an example. Um, 10 years ago, my health is, or my wellness in general, is completely different. In one way, it's better because I think just as I've gotten older, I've become more focused on, more in tune with my body, but also more focused on what helps me, what helps me focus in on wellness past just exercising, just going to the gym. That was what I was like strongly about in my 20s. Um, and so that's on, on the good side. Like I still work out. I still, but there's other things like mental wellness, 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 mindfulness that I really focus on more. But on the other side of that, <laughs> I'm a little bit older. My joints don't work the same way they did. So there are some elements of just wellness that are just more difficult to do. Um, which is a, a little bit of, once again, that those tricky parts about aging. So what happens when we age? So here are some of the prime things that happen when we age. We have chronic disease management, muscle loss and strength loss, changes in the digestive system function in general, changes in sleep quality and quantity, decreased bone mineral density, and changes in appetite, thirst, taste, and smell. So these are a lot of these things are like the basis of existing. And so it feels, you know, really, I guess, disappointing that these are the things that we now have to focus on as we are aging. Um, but this is the reality of life. And we really need to figure out and be able to support each other or support um, the people within our communities on how to do this in a beneficial way. So here are some positive things that are happening while we're getting older. Family growth. If you have children or you have extended family, a lot of times that gets bigger and that's awesome. That's really fun. More leisure time. If you are lucky enough to be able to retire and you know you have some sustainable living situation, maybe leisure time is, you know, a great benefit that that somebody is experiencing as they're getting older. Of course, this is not the reality for everyone. Um, senior discounts. Oh, as many times as I do a variety of things and go, man, if I could just get that senior discount, I know one day I will be able to, but sometimes that's a really awesome thing. Um, retirement kind of ties in with that more leisure time. And, you know, many people are not able to retire, but you have the other portion that, you know, gets the luxury of retirement. 
uh, discovering new interests. And this, once again, also ties in retirement with that more leisure time, you can explore different things in life that maybe you didn't have the time or the ability to do before. And then change in living situation. Now this one, especially because all of you are in housing can be good and bad, depending on the person, depending on their lifestyle and depending on, you know, their whole life situation. So let's look at our life cycle nutri nutrients. So the important nutrients that we're looking at for later adulthood would be fiber, calcium and vitamin D, vitamin B12, potassium and sodium. And I'm sorry, I can't see. Oh, oh no, that was the last one. Okay. Um, so we're going to kind of dive into each one. So first, let's look at fiber. So this is important, number one, for heart health. Fiber can help lower cholesterol by attaching to cholesterol in your blood and helping your body excrete it. Then we look at fiber for our gut health. And once again, something we've already talked about, and I'm sure you all know, it's like as you're aging, your digestive system just becomes a little bit more compromised. You know, you imagine we've been existing and eating and using our digest digestive system for 60 plus years. So it's going to need a little fine tuning. Um, and so fiber is one of those things that can really help because fiber feeds good bacteria in the large intestine, which supports the immune system. Another thing that older adults might be dealing with is just a compromised immune system. It can also have positive effects, excuse me, impacts on diabetes, irritable bowel, irritable bowel syndrome, and heart disease kind of tying in with the heart health. And then just general, um, improvement of digestion. So fiber helps by keeping you regular and combining with water in your digestive tract. This helps provide bulk to your stool, which is very important. We want to make sure to be one of the most important things that our body does. Actually, that's a lie. It does a lot of important things, but one of the really big ones is excretion. It's getting rid of toxins. And so if you're not excreting, if you're not having a bowel movement regularly, your body is still holding on to those toxins. So we want to ensure to bulk up fiber so that we can make sure that we're um, regular. Okay, so let's look at some fiber rich fruit, fruit, excuse me, fiber rich foods. And I also want to say, if anybody has any questions, I'm completely okay if you interrupt, I can't really see anybody. So if you just wanna mute yourself, and shout out your question, that's perfect. Okay, so fiber rich foods. So first we're looking at root vegetables, beets, carrots, potatoes, lentils, beans, and chickpeas, whole grains in general, vegetables, green vegetables more specifically, nut butter, nuts, whole unpeeled fruit. That's really important because most of the fiber li lives in the skin. Um, so if it, if there's no skin on the fruit, then you're really not getting very much fiber and then whole grain bread and pasta. And really when we're talking about whole grains and whole grain bread, something to think about, and this is, will be different for each person is particularly, um, older adults because fiber can be a little bit more diff, especially if it's like heavy uh, food is heavy in fiber, it may be a little bit more difficult for the body to digest. So we don't want to like force fiber down somebody's throat and then cause other issues. So it's figuring out where does the body land in terms of the amount of fiber the body can handle and tr trying to work with that. Okay, so calcium and vitamin D. So first we're looking at bone health. So important. We all are aware that a lot of older adults um, suffer with osteopenia or osteoporosis. And so bone health is really important. There's more likely to uh, experience fractures or breakage of bones. So calcium keeps your bones strong and healthy and a low calcium status may lead to osteoporosis. Teeth health, which is very similar to bone health because teeth, teeth are bones. Um, calcium strengthens the enamel or the outer shell of your teeth. And enamel is important for pre preventing cavities. And then the combined effect. So vitamin D helps your body absorb calcium. You need enough vitamin D for the calcium in your body to do its job. So once again, 
you know, the bone health and the teeth health was mainly about calcium, but vitamin D works well with calcium, really has to work with calcium. So that kind of also highlights making sure you're going outside. Yes, please put on sunscreen, but get outside, get that vitamin D. And there's so many other impacts that vitamin D has on the body and cholesterol is one of them. Okay, so what foods are high in calcium and vitamin D? So of course we know the dairy products, leafy greens, collards, mustards, kale, bok choy, spinach, edamame, almonds, winter squash, and well, almonds is on here twice, but they're extra special. And then for vitamin D, we have canned pink salmon, fortified milk, fortified orange juice, fortified cereal, and sun-dried mushrooms. Mushrooms are really high in vitamin D. So B12, B12 is great for red blood cell formation and DNA formation. It helps your body make red blood cells and DNA. Like I just said, this prevents anemia and other symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency. So one of the biggest symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency is uh, lethargy or lethargy, however you choose to say it. So just that feeling of being weak, and we will often see this in seniors. So ensuring that there's enough B12 may honestly just be the first start to ensuring, oh, okay, this person is feeling exhausted. So that could be the issue. Brain and nerve cell function keeps your brain, excuse me, keeps your body's brain and nerves, nerve cells, cells healthy. This supports normal brain and nervous system function and optimal cognitive functioning. Um, absorption, vitamin B12 is more easily absorbed in its synthetic form, especially in old, older adults. Taking a supplement will provide more B12 than eating foods that are high in, in vitamin B12. So the other thing, the other note in terms of a uh, vitamin B12 deficiency is the second one, which is the brain and nerve cell function. So not being able to feel in just your nerve endings could be another um, B12 deficiency uh, sign. And so vitamin B12, as you can tell, is a really important neurological nutrient. So here are some food sources uh, of B12, beef, mackerel, milk, eggs, yogurt, B12, just the supplement in general and algae. So if somebody is vegetarian or vegan, their best bet is going to be B12, a B12 supplement. And kind of like the last slide said, really, that's usually the more efficient way to get B12 as opposed to consuming the food form. Okay, potassium and sodium. So fluid balance, number one, sodium increases blood pressure and potassium helps lower blood pressure. So we really need for potassium, potassium, <laughs> potassium and sodium. These are nutrients that we want in some form of equilibrium because they work together. Sodium has a negative charge. Potassium has a positive charge. So we need that kind of electrical gradient in the body. Um, nerve plus muscle health. Potassium and sodium are required for proper nerve transmission and muscle contraction, and then energy production. Sodium is necessary for the production of energy in the body. So, you know, this is one of those things that we're also often looking at, and this, this kind of shows the body's just so interesting. And, you know, a lot of the times we're looking at participants, patients that have high blood pressure. But a lot of people actually have low blood pressure, and sometimes the symptoms can look very similar. If you have low blood pressure, you can pass out um, just because your blood pressure isn't, isn't high enough. And then that can either look like not having enough sodium or not drinking enough water. And once again, like I said in the beginning, thirst becomes a, uh, the, the, the ability to experience thirst becomes something that is really important for older adults because oftentimes they lose that ability. So looking at blood pressure, just looking how the body operates in general, potassium, sodium, because they're so integral in fluid, because we're looking at edema, if we're looking at, you know, swelling in different areas, how does potassium and sodium play into that? If we're looking at, you know, we're looking at these nerves and muscles. So we were talking about the B12 in terms of feeling, but the ability to move and just have nerve function can also be related to potassium and sodium and the same thing for energy production. Oops, sorry. 
Um, so some food sources that are high in potassium, we're looking at bananas, avocado, prunes or raisins, oranges, tomatoes, lima beans, and spinach. And then for sodium, foods that are high in sodium, pickles, standard canned soups and vegetables, cheese, processed meats, chips, and most packaged snacks, and then low or no sodium, low salt or no salt added canned foods, fresh fruits and vegetables, unsalted nuts, um, whole, excuse me, whole grains, and then fresh meat. So the caveat with this slide is that obviously if somebody, um, needs more sodium if we're looking to raise their blood pressure. Yes, uh, one idea could be, okay, let's put some more salt in your food. Obviously you don't want it to be ridiculously salty, but just a little bit more, but we don't wanna say, oh, well go have a bag of chips, you'll be fine. That's high sodium food. We would generally like to avoid things like really packaged snacks and chips and processed meats, but this is just a heads up for like, this is where you'll find a lot of high sodium food. So if you have somebody who lives in your facility or you're just working with someone who is like, man, I have high blood pressure. And you know what I've really thought about doing, I see this a lot is I'm gonna, you know, just start, drinking or eating soup. Well, then the question becomes, okay, well, let's look at the soup. Let's read the ingredients, read the label, see how many milligrams of sodium are on it, because oftentimes it is very high, particularly if it's not labeled otherwise. So here is another opportunity for anybody to chime in if you would like. What is a meal you like to make that contains some of these nutrients? And how could you modify your favorite meal to include more of these nutrients we've discussed? Hey, Cynthia, this is Allison. I had yeah. a question going back to the, um, well, I have a few questions, but I wanted to just start with the the question, a question about milk. And yeah. if you could talk a bit about the difference in nutrition level in um, dairy milk and mm -hmm. the different nut milks that now exist in the world. And yeah, if you could speak to that, it would be, I, I'm just personally curious. And then yeah. we'd love to hear like, what are suggestions that you have for folks who may not have access to many of the fresh foods that you've noted and are there other or any resources or thoughts that you would give to folks who are on the call who are maybe working to help make sure that the residents in their community have access to healthful foods? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with the milk. Um, so obviously the main difference is going to be that cow's milk contains lactose. So that's, you know, a nutrient, a sugar that a lot of different digestive systems of different people are unable to break down or not able to break down efficiently. So they have a lot of gastrointestinal issues if they're drinking um, cow's milk. With that being said, when you have nut milks, there's, there's two, two things. It's actually, I was literally maybe 10 minutes ago before this meeting, I was talking to one of my coworkers about nut milks because we were talking about to make a nut milk, to make like almond milk, you buy almonds, you can put it in the blender, you use like a cheesecloth or a drainer, you know, add water and you squeeze it out. There you have an, a nut milk. And if you have ever purchased nuts, you know, nuts are very expensive. So the fact that almond milk that you purchase in the store can be relatively inexpensive, that tells you a few things. One, that it's probably mostly water. Um, it is probably does not, I mean, it probably contains almonds, but not tons of almonds. And then it also contains a bunch of stabilizers, some to just keep the consistently consistency similar to milk. And also a lot of times they'll add additives for color because, you know, just, you know, it's the visual for people. Um, but if you were to have real authentic nut milk, almond milk, cashew milk, you're going to be getting additional fat. There's fat in, in regular dairy milk, um, but you're going to be getting more of a plant fat in addition to other nutrients like magnesium that are contained in nuts. Um, the downside is that like some nuts have calcium in it, but there are quite a few that don't. So if you're looking for something that has more calcium, that has more of the nutrients that you'll find in a regular dairy milk, 
Oftentimes you will find nut milks are fortified with those nutrients. And it just depends on how you feel about that. Um, rather have the nutrient than not. So then, you know, that's a good way to go about it. So I would say the largest difference has to do with the lack, the lactose factor. Um, but yeah, there are tons of other milk milk alternatives. Now, my friend was showing me a cashew milk. I think it was a cashew milk fermented yogurt that looked really interesting, but you know, there's flax milk, there's coconut milk, there's walnut milk. There's really any milk you want, you can find. So that's really uh, a cool place that food has gotten thus far. But I would always suggest if somebody has the ability to make it themselves, you're going to get the best bang for your bust buck, you're also going to get the most nutrients. Um, and when I say best bang for your buck, once again, recognizing that's art, I could find them to be expensive. So I just mean in terms of nutrients and in terms of um, having the best quality of whatever the nut milk you're making or you're drinking, you're going to find that in whatever you make yourself. So uh, the other question being resources for more of these like natural foods, as opposed to maybe a lot of the packaging pack, pack, packaged foods. So I think it, it, part of it, so I can really only speak obviously about here in our organization in the Montgomery County area. So here, I guess also Prince George's County, there are a lot of resources in terms of like food assistance. So for example, at our organization, I would say, I don't want to say half of the food, but we have a very large connection with our farmers. Um, and what that has allowed us to do is to provide a lot of produce. In addition to, we just value nutrition and value health and well-being. So like one thing we don't provide is soda. We, there are a lot of unhealthy foods that we don't tend to provide, but we put that money and we purchase a lot of produce. So I would say, number one, checking in with the local food assistance organizations and seeing if they provide produce. Oftentimes, a lot of the smaller ones may not just because they may not have access to it. But a lot of the larger ones like our organization, but we also have, there's an organization called Capital Area Food Bank, if any of you have heard of it. They cover D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. And they provide, um, they're more of like a, like a hub that provides foods to other organizations. And so like we receive food from them, but there are a lot of other um, food assistance organizations that receive food. They provide a lot of produce also. So it's like checking in with those organizations. I know at MANA, we do a, um, a drop of food at some senior facilities um, around our, our area. So doing things like that. Another way to go about it is that oftentimes, I don't know, I guess people think or assume that buying food fresh is a lot better than frozen. And that's not necessarily true. So a lot of these things you can buy just as frozen and it's going to be less expensive. Mackerel or salmon, you can buy canned salmon, you can buy canned mackerel, get it in water, um, and that's going to be just as good. You're going to get the same nutrients. Um, what is it called? I can't think of the name of the the small fish that typically has like, you can also get it canned. Sardines. sardines thank you. Yes, yeah, sardines. <laughs> <laughs> sardines, like buying canned sardines is a great way to add vitamin D and calcium to your diet. So there are a lot of inexpensive ways to get a lot of these nutrients. I'm going to like flip back through some of the slides and see if I get any other ideas. Um, nuts, excuse me, not nuts. That's not what I was trying to say. Beans, <laughs> beans is what I was trying to go with. Um, canned beans, there's nothing wrong with canned beans. Canned beans are just as nutrient dense as dry beans. So that's always an option. And this is one of the things that I think is important. And if you can find it in your area, a, whether it's a food assistance organization or any other type of organization that talks about the combination of nutrients and cooking, which is usually like kind of my jam, um, we'll talk about how to use different foods to, 
kind of look the same or act the same as something else. So for example, our area here is very diverse and we have a large Latino um, community that comes to uh, Mana Food Center. And typically a lot of Latino communities um, use beans and oftentimes use dried beans. So one way around that is like, man, if you can't access dried beans for whatever reason, canned beans could be a great way to go about it. You just have to work with it differently. And I think that becomes the large um, perspective around food. It's like, okay, well, if you're used to cooking fresh broccoli, maybe you can still make the same thing you're used to making with the frozen broccoli. But once again, because there's already water there, because you might have to heat it a little bit differently, there's just different ways to go about it. So I think my two main uh, suggestions or resources would be checking with local organizations because there are a lot of I actually just went to an anti-hunger policy conference uh, last week and it's it's a nationwide um, conference and a lot of times we're talking about as different organizations from all over the country farms and farm bills and how we're connecting with local produce to ensure that uh, families that might need additional food resources are still able to access fresh food. So checking in with those local organizations or, you know, local, um, there are a lot of farmers markets that also kind of tap into these different things, being able to use SNAP benefits at um, farmers markets, things like that, just those local organizations. My second would be if you're, if you were like, oh, we don't have any of those things, we have to go to the grocery store, but the things on in the produce aisle are just really expensive. Going around, let's look at what's in the frozen food section and see what we can use from there. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, great. Okay. So I'm going to talk about some other food considerations and things to just think about in terms of adjusting how you're cooking and eating strategies as you age. So some changes in physical abilities. Um, aging can present a variety of physical challenges that make it difficult to maintain your previous level of cooking. These tips, excuse me, may make it easier to remain self-sufficient in the kitchen. So number one, getting pop top cans or arthritis friendly canned openers. Um, buying more, excuse me, once again, buying more frozen or pre-cut fruits and vegetables. So not only may that kind of just help your pocket in general, maybe not the pre-cut as much, but more the frozen food. But if cutting and using arthritis, just using grip is an issue, having things pre-cut obviously is going to, you know, kind of take that out. And then using using weighted silverware, silverware if needed for tremors, because it will just give that density to um, help support. So now let's talk about some oral changes. Dysphagia, tooth loss, and other changes may affect our ability to chew or swallow as we age. Relying on natural, excuse me, naturally soft and pureed foods may make it easier to continue eating foods that you enjoy. So, you know, some of these are kind of obvious. Mashed potatoes, scrambled eggs, cooked vegetables, smoothies, yogurts, applesauce, cottage, cottage cheese, pureed soups cooked grains, oatmeal, barley, rice, et cetera, beans and legumes, particularly if they're, they're smashed, um, nut butters, bread, pasta. And really, if you're looking at, you know, getting those nutrients in, obviously smoothies are going to be a great one for that. Um, this is a great place that you can add so many different things. You can always change the flavor. Something I always suggest um, to parents especially when they have younger children that are really into colors or into different flavors is, hey, how can we add a new berry to make this smoothie blue? Okay, well, maybe the next day we have one that's red, like get into it, get into it. It's about nutrients, but it's, it's also about enjoying your food. No, everybody wants to enjoy their food. Okay, so changes in thirst and appetite. 
So as we age, our appetite and thirst mechanisms decrease, but it's important to keep nourishing your body with enough food and fluids to promote health, healthy bodily function. So eating small, frequent meals and snacks daily. Once again, if this is something where someone is not remembering to eat, having a structured way to go about eating is important. So having an alarm on your phone, if the person's wearing a watch, having an alarm on the watch saying, oh, okay, it's time for me to have a snack is going to be really important because oftentimes if you're not getting these nutrients, you know, when you're younger and your body has ways to compensate, it may not be as big of a deal, but as we're getting older and our body really needs, you know, potassium to keep you know, our, our muscles moving or our nerves functioning by getting too little, you can cause a lot more problems faster. Taking sips of water before, after, and between meals. I was having a conversation with my grandmother a few weeks ago and I, I enjoy water. I drink a lot of water and she drinks very little. And she was like, Cynthia, well, how do you, how do you make sure that you drink water or whatever? And what, the things I always tell her is if you're feeling thirsty, you are dehydrated. That is the primary key of like, man, my throat is dry. It's because you're already dehydrated. You're already past the point that ideally you would want to be. So I was telling her, I just make sure or I try my best to drink a lot of water in the morning. And yes, of course, it's annoying to have to go to the bathroom all the time, but it's worth it. And one of the things she was asking, I was like, well, I don't want to get up during the night to have to use the bathroom. And I totally understand that. And that's why you want to try to bulk your water to the beginning of the day. And then you can taper out as you get closer to when you're about to go to sleep. So then you don't have that issue, but just making sure that we're drinking water. And once again, talking about those thirst uh, mechanism, de the decrease of that ability makes it even more important that, well, we need water to function. Your blood is mostly water. Your like all your extremities need water to function. Oxygen, all of those things come in water. So you can imagine if you're not drinking water, you're going to have a lot of issues. And then carrying snacks and water, excuse me, and a water bottle with you when possible. So once again, if you're your resident, your client, your whomever, it's like, oh, you know, I'm going to be out all day. Well, this is the even better reason to make sure you carry a snack in your purse, in your pocket, you know, as best you can carry bottles of water so that you can eat or drink potentially even when you don't feel like it, because it, as long as you, it, I, obviously, ideally you want the person to be aware of, hey, you know, I recognize that I am not able to tap into that thirst or appetite um, quality or I don't say quality, but that, that mechanism anymore. So I know that I need to eat. I know I need to drink water. And oftentimes that may not be the case, but just ensuring that somebody has something on them just in case, um, is probably the best bet. So as I say that I'm going to take a drink of water. Okay. So next we're going to talk about movement and just moving your body as you're aging. So once again, a place for anybody to jump in, how has aging changed your movement habits? And I'll very quickly share again. Um, I mean, basically it's the same thing I was saying a little bit earlier when we started, but just being able to do more and honestly also have the energy to do it. It's like, I still lift weights, but I used to spend more time in the gym. I could be in the gym for two hours. I also had less to do then, but I could be in the gym for a lot longer and then come home and go, oh, I'm going to go hiking or I'm going to go do this other thing where now I just do not have the energy to do. So I've been trying to get up earlier for like the last few weeks and my body is just not letting me. So I think in general, that just changes not only my exercise in terms of what I do at the gym, but you know, my something I see my parents experiencing is like, I've been like, Hey, dad, you want to go on a walk with me? And he's like, ah, oh, my knee is killing me something that he, you know, maybe every now and again, you get an injury, you're in pain, but it's like, no, it's a regular thing. So just looking at how movement has shifted for you and your body or in your resident's body, and how we can adapt to that. Okay.
So let's first talk about the importance of movement as we age. So engaging in regular physical activities such as walking, aquatics, strength training can help keep the body working optimally at all ages. It will also help you retrain muscle mass, which will make it easier to do daily activities such as brushing your teeth, taking a shower, and cooking. Um, so yeah, the, doing regular activity, particularly, you know, ideally it's like, you know, start when you're younger so that as you get older, you maintain that muscle mass. Um, but even if that's not the case, making sure that we're moving our body in general, making sure we keep the blood flowing and those muscles moving will um, aid in our aging, even if you, the, your resident or whomever is in an older adulthood already. So one of the best ways to do this that is uh, less taxing on joints and bones is aquatics, is like some form of swimming or moving because of the buoyancy in the water. You know, the, I would say the lack of gravity, of course there's gravity, but you know, just the ability to float and move those muscles without the joints needing to have impact like with walking, not necessarily with strength training, but um, yeah. Um, Jose, I see that your hand is raised. Feel free to Hi. unmute. Good afternoon. And how you doing, Hi. Cynthia? I just wanted to ask, so I'm, you know, some of the residents would like to have an opportunity to move, mm -hmm. uh, but some of them are fearful of going out into the community or have difficulty with transportation, mm -hmm. they have resources. And so in my mind, I was thinking, hey, why don't we create like a room specifically for them, like a mini gym and putting, uh, I don't know, three, four, uh, um, maybe like a bicycle and then maybe some uh, treadmills. But is there any resources for that to happen uh, in, in for no, nonprofit organizations? I mean, I, I understand there's a, an issue with liability, and, mm -hmm. but is this something that resident, like for example, we have over hundred residents in our building do we have something where we can provide maybe, I don't know, get a grant or get something, some incentive for the benefit of our residents? Yeah, that's a great question. So I am not positive, but I'm, I'm just gonna say I'm not positive, but I'm almost positive. <laughs> so I'm just thinking about one thing um, in Prince George's County, the county in general, they're very active with their seniors. Um, and I say that to say, there's, there's a couple of things. One is to your point, if you have residents that are more nervous about going into the community, having an in-house space is more beneficial. Mm -hmm. There is an organization and it, the name is not coming to mind at the moment that they don't necessarily provide grants for this type of thing, but what they will do is provide classes. So like mm. in one of my next slides, we have like chair yoga and different yeah. like those types of exercises, particularly for seniors that have limited mobility and may not be able to use a treadmill or anything like that. So mm -hmm. I think that's a great avenue. Just generally, I found like group classes, especially if everybody's living in the same building, they get to know their neighbors, that type of thing can be really beneficial, not only physically, but mentally, because then you're getting to know other people. Um, I'll have to look about the grants because I think that is a great avenue. And I it would baffle me that there isn't an organization um, that's that provides either grants for physical activity for seniors or that just generally provides exercise equipment for communities. So okay. I'll have to look, but I'm not positive. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for the question. Cynthia, I was just gonna throw out, um, I'm wondering for other housing providers who are on the call, if you could share if you do have any type of gym or exercise equipment um, that's available to residents on your campus, because I know we have some here in Maryland. I'm just curious if you could share either unmute or share in the chat kind of how you were able to make that happen. Um, I know sometimes, um, so leading age, we have members who are um, kind of providing services to very wealthy individuals, like at a continuing care retirement community. Um, and oftentimes those communities will periodically replace their treadmills and their equipment that they have in their larger gyms. And I know that at times some of our, in Maryland, CCRC members have reached out and said, hey, we have this exercise equipment that we're 
replacing? Do you know anyone who might like it? So mm. maybe even reaching out to your um, local leading age, your state level leading age um, association to see if that might be a possibility in your state. But I'd love to hear from any other members who have been able to set up um, a wellness space on campus if you want to share. And if you don't want to share, that's fine too. But um, I know that those exist. So just wanted to make a note of that for Jose's sake. Thank you. That was a great suggestion. Looks like we have a comment in the chat from Marilyn. She's saying, if you have a large TV in the community room, look to library or local Y for Zoom programs. Gym and exercise equipment, be mm -hmm. mindful of those who may not be able to use it properly, which leads to liability issues. Would be good if a staff member could be available. Mm -hmm. Good thoughts. Yeah, great. Um, so, so here's another, once again, that, that this is more about Montgomery County, but I was talking about Prince George's County, but like Montgomery County offers senior exercise classes. And once again, Jose, this might be a, this different if you have residents who are looking to stay, you know, indoors or within the facility, but for any seniors that are not or would like to or have the ability to find transportation, a lot of these uh county, at least in Maryland, a lot of counties will provide transportation to seniors that may not have transportation. So these are other things to look into, as you can see, it's on here. Um, but provide classes. I know I go to uh, the gym in Prince George's County at the Sports and Learning Complex, and they actually have, it's free for seniors to go into the gym. It's a huge gym. And it's free for them to go to the gym. Monday, Wednesday, Friday from eight to 12. And the idea is that they get, they come in between eight and 12, but they could stay the whole day if they really wanted to. So tapping into those other um, county resources can also be a really great avenue. So we're not going to do this, but this could be something like really simple to do with your residents. Um, yes, if you have a room and you're, you have staff available to say, okay, you know, we're just going to take some time to, you know, move a little bit. And here are some basic ways to add some movement that a lot of people may be able to do. And obviously if somebody is not able to do it, it's not that big of a deal. You know, do what you can is always the motto. So it's rolling shoulders, making sure you're moving your neck doing toe, tap, toe taps and knee extensions. And something else that I think is really important to think about, and it has to do with movement, but not really, is like ensuring everybody, not only seniors, but people in general that you're moving like your lymph nodes on like your neck, recognizing that lymph nodes don't have like your blood vessels because of the heart, it has movement. Lymph nodes do not have that. So the best way to move lymph is moving your body. And if you're not moving your body, your, your lymph is stagnant and that's not great. You can get sick, all the things. So doing something like this, where you're moving your body or you're just using your hands to move your lymph on your neck or wherever, you know, you have lymph nodes here, it's going to be really beneficial just for your general health. Okay, so now we're just going to talk about general wellness and other ways to nurture yourself later in life. So once again, what are some things that you do to take care of your physical and mental health? And once again, I will leave a pregnant pause. And if you want to chime in, great. If not, no problem. So one thing that I have started doing, I have not been consistent with it, but do not model me, be consistent. Um, and something I've gotten like my grandmother into doing is doing the, the paintings that are like numbered. It's a great way to use dexterity. You know, the one I have is very small, but you can get larger ones that paint by numbers and make really beautiful paintings. And it's great for like the creative mind, especially if you're like, oh, well, I want to change the colors that they're saying I should use two. I'm going to use five, like doing stuff like that, but also giving an activity that 
is not like, oh, I did this in five minutes, I'm done. It's something somebody can continue to do. And it's a great way to relax. It's a great way to just kind of like free your mind from whatever whatever other worries you might be thinking about, something to focus on. Um, so that's something I have really enjoyed doing. Walking, I have a dog and I love walking my dog. And I will walk my dog and listen to a podcast. And that's another way that like, I use more of my physical, but also once again, there's that mental health element and it's the ability to listen or focus on something that is not a part of my every day. And it's like the example that's right here says, perhaps you talk to friends, to family, read or play games. How else do you take care of yourself? I think I have found, and obviously this is not everybody's jam, but just talking, having friends, having people to associate with potentially outside of your family is really beneficial. And I think this is something I see often in residential facilities geared for seniors. Um, you often have seniors that may not have friends in the building or may not um, may not be social. And that can be of one of two reasons. Obviously, some people who just are not into that, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but you might have other people that are shy. So providing opportunities for people to socialize can be really beneficial for mental health in general, especially somebody who may understand what you're going through. Um, okay, so why are wellness and self-care so important? So number one, mental and emotional health. Manage stress and deal with negative emotions more easily and cultivate a positive mentality. When you're stuck, and I'm sure we all understand this, when you are stuck in your own funk, that is so difficult because it's hard to see the other side. It's hard to see past the dark clouds and having somebody who doesn't mind reaching their hand in there and like clearing some of those clouds away and just letting some light in, even if it doesn't get rid of all of it, obviously is going to boost your, the positive outlook on life or positive outlook on the day. And that's what's really important. Uh, physical health, maintain independence and the ability to perform daily activities. And we know how important it is for people to maintain their independence as long as they can. And then confidence and resilience, keeping your spirits and energy up, enjoying your day-to-day -day activities more. It's like, hey, you know, if, if I don't have the the independence that I would like to have, I still want to be able to enjoy my life or enjoy what I'm, what I'm in the middle of doing. So ensuring that, you know, if you're in a positive mood, usually that makes everything so much better. And so that's one of the main things we want to ensure that we can provide for people. So how can you promote wellness? So we can promote wellness just in your life by Number one, getting more sleep. I know this can be one of the most difficult things. We all have tons of things to do. You know, the day is never long enough, but just trying, trying to let's shoot for seven, shoot for six hours. You know, as me, I always say, like, just take it one more hour, whatever you're getting now, take the, make the aim to get one more hour and see how that impacts your life. See how you can wiggle that time in um, because this time you will not get back and sleep is also so, so important. Meditating, if that's your thing, once again, is another opportunity for you to potentially be by yourself. You can also meditate with other people, but it's just a time to reflect, a time to just exist and maybe not think about, I got to do this, I got to do that, your checklist, the things you're worried about your spouse is doing or your partner is doing or your kids or whomever. It's like, this is a time for you. And that's really important. Reading a good book, you know, if you like to read, you know, you can find some great adventures in books. And this is another way to kind of live in, outside of maybe the world that you're stuck in. Playing a word game. I love word games. I love Scrabble. I love just figuring out. I love Sudoku. That's not a word game, but just kind of those like paper book games. Um, so once again, another, another great way to relax, engage in a hobby, finding new things to do. And that could be something that one of the things that I'm working on doing right now, as I was saying, I was, I'm pivoting some of my adult education and it's to focus more on seniors. It is to focus more on people that might have limited mobility, but in that my goal is to add potential, add potential hobbies. So there are local, um, 
resources and local organizations, I'll say, hey, like my plan is to go to a senior facility and say, hey, we want to teach gardening. Gardening, You know, maybe it's only three days over three weeks, but this is a new activity that somebody can engage in. You know, maybe there are other things that your residents might be interested in learning and somebody from a nonprofit or somebody from other, another organization can come in and show people how to do something and give somebody a new skill or just a new interest. And then call a friend or a family member, you know, talking, talking out your problems, talking out your thoughts or just like socializing in general can do so much for the soul. Now, this is the end of the, the presentation. Are there any questions, thoughts, comments? Feel free to jump in. And thank you for coming and thank you for uh, paying attention. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Cynthia. It was so great to get this information. Um, are you willing to share these slides or are there any? Sure. Reasons? Okay, great. Yeah. You folks may want to share some of this with their teams or with residents. It's just really easy to understand and digest, no pun intended. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, are there any questions before we close? Okay, well, thank you all so much for joining. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next month, um, the third Wednesday of the month at 12 p.m. Um, feel free to reach out if you have questions or concerns, and we will share the um, recording of the session as well as the slides um, later this week. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of the day. And thank you again, Cynthia.